On today's podcast, The Chucker interviews Marshall Terrell, co-author of Pete Maravich, the authorized biography of Pistol Pete, a 2007 biography of the LSU hoop star. This coincides with the 99 launch of LSU. Terrell and the Chucker covered all in this wide-ranging interview. Terrell is also a prolific author who has penned more than 25 books, including biographies of other gone-too-soon icons. His latest book, Steve McQueen, in his own words, will drop in November. Now, on to the show. Welcome to the 19.9 podcast. Today we are excited to welcome Pete Maravich biographer Marshall Terrell to the show to unpack the compelling life of LSU hardwood legend Pistol Pete Maravich. Marshall, thanks for joining us here today on the 19.9 podcast. Really appreciate you sharing your time. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Cool. So let's kind of start back. You know, you you have this great, rich biography of Pistol Pete Maravich. I want to start by having you dig back nearly two decades. Your co-author on the biography is Wayne Fetterman, who's a comedian, actor, and also a former writer on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. I want to get a sense just of what brought you to this pro, what brought this project to life, and how did you come to work on it with Wayne? Well, it's very interesting. Um, what brought it to life was I was watching. I think it was the 1996 All-Star Game. And, uh, and on that broadcast, they had listed the 50 greatest NBA players of all time. And at that time, Pistol Pete was, I think, the only deceased person, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, you know, it, it just when, – when they made that announcement and I saw his two boys step up to the podium in his honor – something something deep within me you know happened you know it was I was struck because you know Pistol Pete was my basketball idol growing up and as he was millions of other people and um, so that from that moment probably for the next year I couldn't stop thinking about the idea of doing this book on him and there were nights uh, that I would dream about Pistol Pete and and you know I, I know that you as a a, a current journalist, I'm sure that probably resonates with you when you get something in your mind um, or something that just resonates with you, you know, it doesn't go away and it stays with you. And that's, uh, and that's kind of how I, I go about projects. If, you know, if, if I start thinking about it and it starts resonating with me and it won't go away, that's a pretty good gut check. Um, so that's how I got sparked. And what brought me to Wayne Federer was the, I didn't know Wayne Fetterman was a comedian and actor and, and, uh, you know, all these, uh, interesting things, you know, he, he also, he's done, I want to say close to probably 50 to a hundred movies. Um, and, yeah. And, and yeah, because the, there'll be times when my wife and I'll be looking at the TV and she'll go, Oh, Hey, there's Wayne. And, you know, more often than not that that, that happens. But how I met Wayne was he didn't advertise who he was uh, on the internet. And, and keep in mind, this is, we're talking 1998 now. So we're talking, you know, internet's sort of in its early days. And, um, and so Wayne, did, again, didn't post his name. He, he went by the, the nickname Feruzzi, F R. F E R R U Z I. And that's just kind of, he was known as. And so he posted all these incredible Pistol Pete uh, videos uh, that he had. And I had nothing. And um, so I started doing research on the book. And I started emailing them and I say, hey, I would just love to have these videos of yours. Um, you know, wh what can I pay you? He goes, well, I won't charge you anything. I'll just send them to you because, you know, you're doing it as a book. So. Then we started developing this email friendship where I was I was writing some chapters and I was sending it to him. And then he would just kind of fill in little spots here and there where, you know, he put in some stats or he or he he not correct me on something, but would add a little something that would just make it pop and um, and bring it bring it some perspective like, oh, well, this achievement's even more amazing than I thought it was. So. It was one of the, what I call those uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney moments, you know, where when they first met and John Lennon 
saw Paul McCartney and he said, you know, I want to be the star of this band, but, um, you know, if I include this guy, he'll make me better. And that's kind of the moment that I had with Wayne. And I, again, not knowing who he was, I just simply flat out asked him, hey, would you be interested in co-authoring this book with me? And he didn't say yes immediately. I thought he would have jumped at it. He didn't say yes at first. He had to give it some real thought. And then that's when he revealed to me who he was, what he was doing. Um, and, um, you know, because uh, he, he he put his full effort into this. And I, I'm assuming he probably gave up a couple of gigs to do this book. And um, so that's kind of how the two of us got together to write this project. Was Wayne like you? Like, where was his attraction to Maravich? You mentioned Maravich was your basketball idol growing up. Was Wayne much the same? Oh, yeah, very much the same. I mean, and again, um, I don't know how old you are, but but Pete Maravich was the Pied Piper of basketball. He, it was just as, you know, the NBA at that time, people can't conceive of this, but um, when Pistol Pete came into the NBA, it opened up a whole new uh, thing for the league. It was because if I'm not mistaken, there was maybe one basketball game a, a week on, if that and basketball just did not have the same popularity that it enjoys today. And so when pistol Pete became a pro, you know, uh, it just, and more basketball games were on the NBA. It started getting a lot more coverage. Um, it just crossed over into this other new realm and, um, you know, basketball picked up millions of new followers. And so Wayne and myself, Wayne's a little bit older than me, but um, it, uh, it, it Pistol Pete touched upon um, there was something magical about him to kids. And uh, a lot of kids followed him. And it wasn't just the style of play. It was his style of fashion. He was just – it was as if he was dropped out of the sky, uh, just kind of like Jimi Hendrix in a way, just a, a totally new – uh, uh, archetype for basketball and uh, you just couldn't resist him. He was just a uh, you know, good looking guy had a sense of style and fashion uh, played the way that you wanted to play and um, you know, he had millions and millions of followers You, you know, you mentioned kind of the, the the impetus for getting into this was seeing his two sons uh, represent him with the 50 greatest players um, uh, celebration. As you, especially as you started getting deeper into the research, what really kind of drew you to Pistol Pete's story? Because it, one thing that I think happens is you could have this great excitement for an idea. And as you dig further, you ah, there's not too much here. But I have a feeling the exact opposite happens with Pistol Pete. Like the more layers you were peeling away, the more intriguing it became. So, so off, you know, off the bat, and especially as you started in those early stages of research, what really drew that excitement to Pistol Pete's story for you? Well, uh, you know, I always look at other books, what's been done in them, um, has the definitive book been done? And um, the answer was no. And that's, you know, like, okay, I've got a, I've got a real opportunity here to do a serious biography on him. I mean, even his autobiography, um, it wasn't able to, because it was written by, by him and, and another writer, he mm-hmm. wasn't able to brag about himself. He wasn't able to talk about his achievements. He, I mean, he, t- he talked about his life and he talked about some of his accomplishments on the hardwood, but he wasn't able to brag on himself um, as we could as writers. And, you know, obviously we want to be as objective as possible, but um, I saw a real opportunity to do a definitive biography because, um, you know, enough time had passed now where people accepted him as this historical figure. And um, the books that that had been done on him before, they were just, um, you know, they just didn't have the same sort of seriousness. Um, And I knew things about his his life uh, that I wanted to highlight um, or things that he talked about in his book, but just gave little mention to. I wanted to expand on those sorts of things. So um, it was, you know, I once interviewed uh, Jay Leno and, uh, you know, he had had just left the the Tonight Show and I had asked him, uh, you know, he was talking about his act. And that's what he's publicizing. And, and so what he basically was saying, I, I, I asked him, what's the difference between a monologue and your show? And he basically said, well, my monologue, you know, is, is 12 minutes and that's all I can do. But when I do a show, it's a full out 90 minute concert. And that's kind of what I wanted to do. The same for Pistol Pete was just that 
full out definitive biography that really explored his background, explored his psyche, explored all of his hardships. And, um, and, you know, of course, uh, certainly, um, his Christianity at the end of his life. I, I wanted to explore that as well, because that all is part of his story and, and why he made this dramatic, you know, turn to Christ. Yeah, it's a really intriguing story. Um, I think so many of us know about his great success on the basketball court, but as I think so many, um, so many of us, I mean, we're, we're human beings, and there's so many some complexities and things to us. And so, if we kind of go back, you mentioned kind of this more definitive, real, real deep look at who he is, especially when we talk about the beginning of Pistol Pete and um, you know his early life. What stood out about those early years and and really his rise? as a basketball prodigy, um, you know, through the early years and, and really into like the high school ranks? Well, for me, it was, you know, as I read his story, um, his story was almost mythical. It was almost like a fairy tale. And there were things in there that I just, I found hard to believe. Um, so I wanted not to disprove them, but just to make sure that they were true. For example, um, practicing eight hours a day and then going to the movie theater and, and he would, he would during, you know, during, back in the old days you had intermission. So during um, one, one part of the movie, the first part, he would go on the, the left side of the aisle and just dribble the basketball while he was sitting and um, we were watching that. And then, and then going, then, then during the intermission, he would go to the right side of the aisle and, um, and uh, would would dribble on his, with his right hand, and but it comes to life though when you start interviewing people. Like, yeah, I was there in a the movie theater where that happened, and it so it, it disproves that mythology. Um, he talked about in his book that uh, press would um, have him in the car, and he would dribble at twenty thirty miles an hour with with Pete hanging out of the car and dribbling, and you know you just go, come on, that can't be real, and then. You know, you interview somebody who goes, no, I saw the Mary Riches do that. I thought they were crazy. Um, so, you know, you, you start you start digging into those sorts of stories. And, and, you know, it's one thing to have Pete tell it, but it's another thing to have a neighbor who knew Pete, uh, who lived down the street, who could verify those types of stories and then get their anecdotes. So it's a, it's a whole different vibe. And, you know, speaking to that, there's and, and maybe, you know, as, as the guy who wrote the definitive biography uh, on Pistol Pete, there's a pretty famous story, which maybe you can say this is fact or fiction, where Press, his father, Press Maravich, who was a basketball coach, he actually shrunk the size of their home basketball hoop to make it smaller. So that way, when he got on the real basketball court, the hoop seemed so much bigger. Is there any truth to that? You know, I don't I don't know that for a fact, but but the, the Mariches would do things like that. Um, so uh, the, the answer would be that's probably true. I, I don't particularly remember that story, but he would perhaps do urban, perhaps urban legend getting in the way here. But there's a yeah. lot of legend surrounding Pistol Pete, certainly. Right. And, and you know, and, and Pete. Pete was probably the first one to, to tell you those things, but, um, you know, you have to kind of rely on what other people said to, to, to make sure that it was true. But, you know, something like that, I could, I could certainly believe after doing the research that I did. Absolutely. You know, I just mentioned his father press. Um, so when, when Pete goes on to, um, Louisiana state, he is coached by his father press who had previously coached at Clemson and NC state. So how would you characterize their relationship and how do you think that shaped Pete Maravich? Well, it's interesting because I'm Serbian and the Maraviches are Serbian and I had a very close relationship with my father. Um, and so I could very well relate to what these two gentlemen were thinking and feeling. Um, and so I would characterize their relationship as what other people said it was. And that basically was, it seemed like it was a codependent relationship. Those two guys, um, really loved each other, but a lot of people said they acted like brothers. I mean, they were just... They were, you know, a, a lot of people that achieve greatness, they, they go out of their way to try and disprove their dad um, or, or try and stick it to their dad. And, and that forever stays with them. Pete was different. He wanted to always please his dad. And that's what drove 
peak to greatness. And um, so they had this incredible close relationship almost to the point where it, it, it shut out the mother. And, and of course that manifested itself later on uh, in, uh, in their lives. But um, you know, Press's relationship with Pete was it it it, 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 it shaped him in that it was just you know it, it, there would be no Pete Maravich story if it weren't for Press and I'm not talking just the, the fact that he gave birth to the guy it, you know he was he was his father he was his mentor he was his coach he was his friend he was his buddy um, and uh, you know they were as two they were as close as two human beings could be. Um, and some people think that, um, you know, press ruined him. There's, there's that story. I don't, I don't think that's the case at all. I think press made him and press mm. gave him the vision of being the first uh, player, you know, to, to make a million dollars, you know, he, uh, but he would also, he would tell him things like, you know, son, you, um, I don't have the kind of money to send you to college, but if you commit yourself uh, to working on your game, you could get a scholarship to college and you could get, you know, and then, and then you would then make your way to the pros and then you would make a million dollars. You know, and he was the guy that set that vision for Pete. Yeah, really interesting. And so speaking of press, so as I said, Pistol Pete uh, plays at LSU under his father and at LSU uh, Maravich averages more than 44 points a game and he does so without a three point line and he was certainly known as a wizard with the ball in his hands um, his pro career certainly solid he gets four all NBA nods he makes five all star teams but ultimately his pro career is pretty derailed by injuries and he ends up actually retiring at age 33. So what did you kind of see in pistol Pete Maravich as he moved from the college star to the pro ranks and really kind of ran through his, his uh, 20 something years and then into his thirties, what really jumped out about that era of his life? Well, I'll, I'll go by what he said. And that was that uh, basketball ceased to be fun and um, it became dead serious and it became a business and, you know, he talked about the business being cold. And um, and so it, it was almost as if um, the life force was sort of taken out of him. Um, and, you know, that makes sense for a guy who, by his own admission, really loved the game. And I think we see this happen with a lot of players. Um, they, their love of the game, and it can be kind of challenged by the business side of it, especially in the pro ranks. Yes. And, and not only was there this coldness, but um, there was also the fact that, you know, he was he was a couple of different things. He, he was he was the great white hope and he was he was put on a team that basically didn't want him. It was the owner that wanted him. Um, and, you know, he, he was also, you know, the, the, the real interesting thing here is that the Celtics wanted him. Tommy Heinsohn wanted him to uh, lead that team. And if you, th- if you remember how great the Celtics were, everybody always thinks about the Celtics, uh, the great team of the sixties. They were pretty, they were pretty good dynasty in the seventies. And mm-hmm. think about pistol Pete. They, I think they won 72, 74 and 76, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but think of how many more championships they were won with pistol Pete as the point guard. Or yeah. running that offense. So, um, you know, so, so you've got this, you've, you've, you've got this situation, this dynamic where he's the great white hope. He's, you know, he, he's only 22 years old. All this pressure is being put on his shoulders. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then on top of that, he's, he's, he's stuck, uh, you know, with, with the, he, he'd rather be, he'd rather be playing with the Boston Celtics. And, um, you know, I was having this interesting conversation with my nephew the other day about LeBron James and how if you're a superstar in this, in this era, you can pretty much tell, uh, yeah, dictate. The league, dictate, <laughs> yeah. yeah, where you want to go. And ba- back then you could not do that. You were, you were beholden to whomever drafted you. And so, um, you know, that was, that was the, the rub with, with Pete Maravich. It's interesting, you know, you talk about him joining the Celtics too. He joins and, and him be, and Pete Maravich being the great white hope. Um, by the time he joins the Celtics in 1979, 1980 season, 
he's uh, that great white hope has flamed out a little bit. But ironically, he joins the team with Larry Bird in his rookie year, and that is the great white hope as well. <laughs> so uh, it's like a passing of a torch, I guess. Oh, it absolutely was. And those two, um, we interviewed a, gu- a guy that worked for the team at the time, and I was saying, I was asking him, what was the dynamic between those two? And he said they like to give each other a hard time. He said there was a little jealousy. Um, on Bird's part regarding uh, Pistol Pete, even though, you know, Bird was the guy. But, um, uh, th- you know, if, if you read the book, there's there's a lot of uh, I- interesting um, – there's a very interesting dynamic that goes on between those two guys. Absolutely. So, you know, with, with Pete Maravich, he is sometimes – especially as you kind of refl- – those uh, people reflect on his career, he sometimes criticized for being more showman than winner. I think Pat Riley once called Maravich the most overrated superstar. Um, his critics will point to his – they say, you know, this guy never played in an NCAA tournament team at LSU. Um, now, granted, the tournament was smaller then, and the NIT had a little bit more prestige, and he did play in that, but never played in an NCAA tournament team at LSU. Um, although the program did improve massively during his time there, in his NBA career, he only played in 26 playoff games, and one-third of those came when he was a bench player for the Celtics in 1980. Um, as you kind of reflect on his career, is that criticism fair that he was more showman than winner? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely not fair. Um, he was a showman. Um, that's what paid his contract. That's what put uh, people in the seats. But he was a winner and he had a winning attitude and he 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 hated winning. I'm sorry. He hated losing. And he he internalized those losses because he um uh, I can remember uh, a story in, in in his book and what we wrote about. I, I think his freshman basketball team at LSU, they were, they went undefeated that season and they were playing a great University of Tennessee team, and it all came down to some free throws. And, and Maravich, I think, missed one, and then they lost the game. And um, that night, you know, he didn't go back on the team bus. He walked home, or he walked like from from the Coliseum to the hotel room. And then he, what he walked these, uh, railroad tracks, you know, so that, that goes to show you how much he hated losing. And, you know, the great superstars are like that. I mean, Michael Jordan's like that. Kobe Bryant's like that. Um, you know, all the greats hate losing. Um, so that was a, that was a, a, a trait of Maravich's, but the, again, it goes back to the fact that, you know, he was stuck um, on uh, these teams that that needed um, a uh, box office attraction, but didn't necessarily want to fill out the roster any more than they had to. So he was stuck with those those uh, teams throughout his career, and there was really nothing he could do about it. And uh, I'll address the Pat Riley thing. Um, uh, the, the, that, that statement came from a Sports Illustrated article from 1978, I think. And you, you got to think about this. But at that point in time, um, I'm sure Maravich had burned Riley, on de- who was considered one of the, you know, the great defenders, many, many times. Um, and when, when Pistol Pete died, you know, uh, Riley called him one of the greats. So um, I don't know if he was being nice, but he certainly – you know, when, when Maravich passed away, you know, he, he gave him his just due. Mm, gotcha. So, so Maravich, as I said, he retires at 33 years old and he leaves the game in 1980 after that short stint with the Celtics. Now his post playing career is this really intriguing, really odd mix. In fact, uh, to be frank. So he disappears for a time. He gets into yoga, astrology, mysticism, and he, and he does get more heavily into booze as well. Um, there's a story that he painted a roof, a message on the roof of his home, offering himself up as a UFO captive. Um, he says God talked to him, and he turns deeply into his faith. And you mentioned his Christianity early. So, what do you kind of find most notable or interesting about his post basketball life and all the interesting, odd turns that took? Well, I, I find it all interesting because. Um, you know, you're, again, you're talking about um, he went from, you know, basketball player into all these weird sorts of things um, that you don't necessarily associate with a pro athlete. And um, uh, what I find the most interesting was, you know, his life was pretty well documented. But that period from 1980 to 83, when he gets into all this stuff, you can barely find an ounce of uh, information on him. Mm-hmm. 
And um, so the, the fact that he just went from fad to fad to fad um, and there was this desperation to his life. Um, and he, you know, he, he talked about how basketball just did not fulfill him. And he just thought that, uh, that he would have been happy for the rest of his life. And, you know, to, to me as a biographer, this is, this is interesting stuff because then now you're getting down to the nitty gritty of who a human being is. And he, he's not talking about basketball stuff. He's talking about deep, deep subjects here. And, um, that's what I found really interesting about Pistol Pete was that he was a deep guy. He was a deep thinker. Even when, you know, he, he talked about basketball, he predicted things um, that uh, that you saw come to pass in 10 to 20 years. I mean, his style of play obviously was 30 years ahead of his time. But, um, you know, in, in interviews and you, 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 you look at what he says, he talked about you know, the six ten guards and he talked about how the basketball game was gonna be quicker and faster mm-hmm. and open up. Um, you know, he 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 thought like an artist and, and so you saw that's what he was on the court. There's a couple of you know, there there are athletes and then there are artists. I always thought of Pistol Pete as an artist. And Paul Westfall had said it beautifully. He said the, 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 he said the, the basketball court was Pistol Pete's canvas and the ball was his paintbrush. And, um, you know, I think of guys like Pistol Pete, Dr. J, um, and just only a few others who, um, who are real artists. And so uh, I know it's, it's a long way to answer your question, but I, I found all those things interesting about his post-basketball life. You know, you're, you brought up earlier um, his relationship with his father, and perhaps at that came at the expense of the mother. His mother does commit suicide um, in yes. a very kind of tragic way. Um, how do you think that influenced him? Oh, I, it, it, I think Pistol Pete suffered from depression, and I think that contributed greatly to it. Um, you know, and in his book, he, he looked back and – he talked about how he impressed their interaction sort of edged her out and, and how guilty he felt as a son for doing that. And, you know, it pains you to read those sorts of things. But, um, uh, you know, she also had some mental illness, too, uh, that probably wasn't talked about. But, um, you know, that's that's the sad part. You know, there's just a lot of sad aspects to Pete, Pete Maravich's life. Um before he gets, you know, before he becomes a born again Christian and he gets saved. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So there were just, there was that, there was the alcoholism, you know, there were a lot of things working against him, And that's, that's what was really interesting about him was like, how can anybody play at such a high level with all these personal problems? It was always fascinating. And I'm not so sure I answered it other than the fact that he put in so many hours of dedication as a young yeah. kid that, you know, those, those talents, uh, stay yeah. with him. And, you know, he was just that brilliant. You know, when you talk about his play on the hardwood, he was just that brilliant that um, he could. So it, it is a pretty fascinating thing, though, that he had this ability to play at such a high level with perhaps so much stress, you know, around him. Yeah. Yes. You know, his former teammate uh, on the Hawks, Lou Hudson, one set of Maravich, and I thought this was so interesting. It never looked easy being Pete Maravich. Do you think that's true? I think it is. And, and, I, and I know, I know what he's saying. Um, he was, he was talking about the, you know, the great athlete who was relegated to um, subpar teams and never really being able to get his due. And uh, you know, that's, that's definitely true that that was. And so Lou saw that firsthand and um, you know, he saw a lot of that, um, tortured artist. You know, when you dig into someone's backstory as deeply as you did in the biography, you can unearth some really interesting and really unexpected things. I would imagine you went into this project, you had your knowledge about Maravich, um, you know, certainly of his, his, his granddaughter on the basketball court, but probably even beyond that too. And, you know, you knew a little bit of details about his life, but especially as you really dug into his story, what were you surprised to learn about Maravich and particularly maybe things you didn't expect to discover? Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I was surprised that he was able to play at such a high level, um, given all the personal demons that he had going on. Um, I didn't, um, 
I didn't expect him to be such a deep human being um, because at the end of his life, when he gave his testimony, I mean, you're talking about a, a, a really blessed public speaker who could mesmerize you. Um, and I didn't expect that from him. Again, I, I've known a lot of professional athletes in my day and, you know, they're usually kind of easygoing, fun loving guys. Um, not too deep, but Maravich again was the exception. He, and, and he would have been a guy that you would want to, uh, have a really cool discussion with. And he could, he could talk about a number of subjects. So when he, when he dug into something like when he dug into UFOlogy, when he dug into uh, yoga, astrology, he went at it with full force and full gusto. Um, and so, it, so, and later on, that manifested itself when he became a Christian. Because when he, when he became a Christian, it was almost as if this this um, incredible evangelist just got flicked on because. He was able to talk uh, again. He, he became a Christian, but then like, you know, within within weeks, uh, he, he was able to talk very knowledgeably about the Bible. He was able to discuss very, very deep subjects, just like an evangelist would. So um, uh, that that was the most surprising thing that, to discover about him uh, personally. <laughs> You know, you, we've talked about um, him being this great player. We talked about him being troubled at times. We talked about him finding himself. We talked about his mother's suicide. You know, there's, and again, the complexities of a character like this. Uh, ultimately, did you find him endearing? Did you find him troubled? Did you find him a tortured genius? Was he a sympathetic figure? What did you come away thinking of Pete Maravich? Well, he was he was all those things. He was an endearing human being. Um, he was troubled. He was a tortured genius, and he was a sympathetic figure. Uh, you know, I, you know, I, there were many, many points in the story where I just felt sorry for the guy. And you know, it's hard to feel sorry for a guy who's good looking, has got the perfect build, yeah, seemingly has it all. <laughs> yes, he has it all. It, you know, it's worth millions of dollars, and and yet you just go, oh man, I just I wouldn't want to be this guy for anything in the world. Um, but ultimately, I, I came away thinking of Pete Maravich as having a lot more respect for him than I did because of, of the man that he became, uh, of the human being that he became. I mean, he became this guy that, you know, I interviewed people that said, you know, uh, he just became such a very, very thoughtful human being. He, he'd write a check for anything or anybody. Um, uh, on turkeys, he would be delivering uh, – on Thanksgiving, he would be delivering turkeys to the poor. Um, you know, he just uh, – he had camps for kids and he would just take extra time to be with people and just be real and be in the moment. And, um, you know, uh, the, you know the, the, it was just tragic that he died when he did because he was – becoming a really interesting human being and um, a humanitarian and um, you know just just a uh, just an incredible guy you know he uh, and I want to wrap it up here because he's been gone for for 32 years yet there is still such an aura and a mysteriousness um, and an intrigue around Pistol P. Maravich why do you think that is well, you know, I do books on people, uh, on iconic figures, and, and the ones that last the longest uh, are the ones uh, that people recognize. This guy gave his whole life to his craft, and that's, somehow or another that resonates with people. Like, for example, um, I haven't done a book on Bruce Lee, but uh, I think Bruce Lee sticks around because people know that he dedicated his whole life uh, you know, to his, to his uh, art form. Um, same thing with John Lennon. You know, John Lennon lived, breathed uh, music, and you know his music was autobiographical. And uh, I, I think with Pistol Pete, there was something autobiographical about the way that he played basketball, um, and it was magical how he played. And people recognize that he did things on the court that people still can't do. Um, and he's ten times the player that anybody is today. And if Pete Maravich played basketball today. Uh, they can only imagine like how many times he'd be on sports center or how many times his clips would be on TV at night that they, they know for a fact that this is a guy that could have played in any generation. Uh, and yet his style of play transcends time. 
Um, and it was really ahead of his time. And they, I think they feel, they feel empathy for him because they, they know that at, at that get that time that he played basketball, he wasn't appreciated, but now he's certainly appreciated as an artist and as a player. Yeah, well, that's great. Well, Marshall, I don't want to take up any more time here today. We're certainly grateful to 99 Podcast for you jumping on and sharing what is the story of a real basketball legend um, and obviously a very human story, too. So thanks so much for your time here today and joining us on the 199 Podcast. All right. My pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the 199 Podcast with HVS, the High Volume Shooters. For more information, check out the blog at 199.com under HVS. And while you're there, do yourself a favor and pick up some retro college tools. Till next time.